Habu Hotel is an online multiplayer game aimed primarily at teenagers. The game allows you to explore rooms, chat with other players, and make your own creations. But most importantly, it allows you to trade. As Habo's monetization model relies on the purchase of virtual coins, it is in Habo's interest to generate demand for their currency. And over the past 20 years, Habo has meticulously crafted an ultra consumerist environment to facilitate this demand. This is what I explored in my previous video. But what happens if people don't want to pay for coins? What happens when people get fed up of waiting in privatised bread queues, working in drab corporate jobs, or selling their personal details away in dodgy survey sites? Well, they turn to crime. Over the past six months, I've talked to dozens of players to explore the topic of financial crime, logging over 200 pages of interview transcripts, reading the relevant academic literature on the topic, and even catching people in the act. In this video essay, I will explore how financial crime has evolved over time, how Habo chooses to respond to financial crime, and finally give you a personal note. I hope you enjoy. Back in the early 2000s, the internet was the new frontier of technology, and being new and unfamiliar, it was basically the Wild West. Habo Hotel was a game birthed during this era, and being an innovative new game, it was rather broken. Scripters were players who basically hacked the game using exploits. They manipulated code within the game. While some scripters did it merely for fun, such as allowing themselves to decorate their rooms better, Others decided to give themselves endless amounts of coins and rare items. This was also a time when internet security wasn't much of a thing. For example, it has been alleged that one of the richest players in UK Habo obtained their wealth through one of the largest hacking conspiracies in the game's history. I would like to point out that I was unable to cross-reference this claim. I'd like to tell you the story anyways, as it helps illustrate a point. Back in 2002, Ione, who was serving as the UK's hotel manager, gave each player who logged in during her birthday a special gift. Each gift contained one of three items, a throne, a Russian samovar, or a holoboy. Collectively, these items would be known as the Ione gifts, and they would end up being highly sought after. The throne, in particular, would continue to dominate the market for generations, and its contemporary value sits at around 600 coins, or around 48 US dollars at black market rates. Now, let's move forward to 2006. The player made a realisation. Most of the recipients of the Iona gifts, the players of 2001 and 2002, were most likely to have moved on from Habo and would have left their accounts abandoned four years later. And so, allegedly, they began to conduct brute force attacks against vast swathes of abandoned accounts, helpfully aided by Habo itself, which decides to publicly display when users have last logged in. These brute forcing attempts were also helped by the fact that back in the day, there were no password requirements. As such, someone could literally set their password as 123456, or password. And in the age where internet security wasn't as prevalent, you can guess what people set their password as. By spamming thousands of username and password combinations, they were able to crack account after account, taking both the account and the Ioni gift that came with it. And being the enterprising hacker that they were, they didn't let the hacked accounts go to waste. Some of these accounts had so-called rare names, usernames which were highly sought after, and players were willing to pay a high price for them. It was claimed that the operation was so profitable that they had to subcontract their work to others to hack accounts for them. Habo eventually caught on to these brute force attacks, and soon required users to log in with their emails as opposed to their usernames, and it also started implementing password requirements. Old-fashioned hacking was being clamped down, and scripting was pushed more and more into obscurity. Enterprising criminals, for the most part, couldn't rely on exploiting Habo's instability or flaws to get rich anymore. There were clearly successful attempts, such as in 2017, when two players exploited a hole which allowed them to generate millions of coins. But these hacks against Habo itself became rarer, so criminals had to find another way. But don't underestimate bored teenagers and their desire to obtain virtual currency. Scams have been ubiquitous in the world of Habo. 
Being scammed is such an ingrained experience of Habo that it acts almost like a rites of passage. Unlike the hacker, which utilises technical expertise, the scammer utilises confidence and charisma. Habo has an entire page cataloguing many common scams on their website, but this video would be a lot longer if we tried to cover every single scam. Back when people still logged in with their usernames, password scams were fairly common. For example, a scammer might say, Oh look, Habo senses your password. The victim would then proceed to type their password, and the scammer would log into the victim's account and change their login details. If the scammer was more daring, they could tell the victim to type their password and press Ctrl M instead. In the past, Ctrl M acted the same way as the enter button. Habo has now since patched this. Another low effort scam involved the scammer claiming that they had special hacking tools to duplicate furniture or coins. All the victim had to do was hand over their coins to the scammer, then the scammer runs away with the money. This scam happened so often, a counter scam was developed where someone would pretend to be a sceptical yet naive victim. The victim would claim that they were going to give one coin to the scammer as a test to see whether the scammer is legit. If the scammer could double the victim's money, they would hand over a larger sum of coins. Sensing blood in the water, the scammer would pretend to double the victim's money and hand over two coins. The victim would then run away. As time moved on, players generally became more clued up to these rudimentary low effort scams. The decline of these low effort scams were also due in part to the efforts by moderators, when they existed back then, who would ban anyone who tried to claim that they can duplicate furniture or coins. And so, scams became more sophisticated. Falling Furniture FF is a game hosted on Habu, and it's sort of like musical chairs. The host would place down chairs in a room, and people would rush to sit on them. The last remaining person to not get a seat gets eliminated from the round, and the cycle repeats until a winner is produced. In the past, hosts would ask the loser whether they wish to pay to stay, pay for revenge, or leave the game. This choice is commonly referred to as P2S, Rev, or Kick. Pay to stay allows the player to stay on the game, effectively doing a rerun of that round. Usually the cost of pay to stay is one coin, or its furniture equivalent. Revenge, on the other hand, allows the player to pick someone else to lose that round. This bizarre mechanic essentially meant that any player could effectively pay to kick a player they did not like. Because it was a much more powerful option, the price of revenge is usually higher, around 2-3 to three coins. Now here's the catch, when someone is a victim of revenge, they don't immediately get kicked out. Instead, they're given a choice to pay to stay, pay for revenge, or to leave the game. This has led to the phenomenon of Rev Wars, which is when two people battle it out by revving each other. And by revving each other, I mean one person pays the host coins, and then the other pays the host coins, and then they but you're starting to see how profitable Rev Wars can be. Scammers, however, began exploiting this business model, and here's how you do it. Step 1. Hire a scamming buddy. This person will be your partner in crime. If you are proficient enough to play with two accounts at once, you could also use an alt account. Step 2. Advertise a lavish game. If you want to pull people in, you want to make sure that you have a large prize. The larger the prize, the more willing people will be to spend money on P2S and Revs for a chance to win a prize. Step 3. Make your partner the winner. If your partner is the winner, you can pretend to give them a prize without actually giving them anything. It would give the illusion that you are a trustworthy host and you are able to bag any P2S and Rev money as profits. But how do you reach this stage? Well, if your partner ends up losing a round, they can just Rev someone. They don't actually have to pay you anything, they only pretend to pay you something. If they choose a particularly wealthy victim, they could even start a Rev War. A Rev War that your partner can't possibly lose. At the end of the day, you count up your profits and split half to your partner in crime. Or you could just ban them and keep all of the profits. Pay to stay scams in their day were one of the most lucrative scams on Habo, and arguably the key to its success was the fact that it was much more sophisticated. Unlike the I can double your money or give me your password scams, pay to stay scams themselves were not automatically incriminating. You had to prove that they were working in concert with someone else, and you had to check transaction logs to see whether the trades actually happened, which altogether led to many of the pay to stay scammers not being dealt with. In the end, pay to stay as a concept phased out. 
It is commonly believed that pay to stay is now a banned practice in Habo, something that also followed the gambling ban back in 2014, but I was unable to verify that this was true. On the contrary, according to the official Habo help page, pay to stay and rev is seemingly allowed. Whatever the case, its long-standing connotation of being an outright scam makes it no longer a widespread practice. Another sophisticated scam is the fake buyer scam. To give some context, Habo's economy is very reliant on merchanting, which is the practice of buying furniture at a low price and selling that furniture at a higher price for profit. Habos could literally spend hours on end at their shops waiting for customers to buy their goods, and then spend more hours scouring other shops owned by other Habos to buy more items. Then they would sell those newly acquired items at a markup to get more money, to buy more items to sell. What was I even doing with my life? The fake buyer scam specifically targeted merchants, and this is how it's done. Step 1. Obtain furniture. These pieces of furniture must be disposable. Preferably, you want a piece of furniture that most people will not have and one that is cheap for you to buy. An example furniture that you could use for this scam are these red pixel furnitures. Most new players haven't seen it before and if you know where to look for it, you can easily buy 10 for 1 coin. Step 2. Get yourself an alt account. You could also employ a scamming partner, but it's completely unnecessary and also you banned them. Step 3. Enter the shop with your alt account. This is the fake buyer. Pretend to browse around with your alt account, maybe make some small talk with the shop owner. If you're feeling daring, you'd even try and buy something to establish a relationship. Step 4. Plant the seed. Ah yes, I was wondering if you had any red pixel furniture by any chance. Chances are, if the shop owner did not display the red furniture in their shop, they probably wouldn't. Ah, I see, you reply. Well, if you do find any red furniture, please contact me as soon as possible. You add them to your friend list and then mention something along the lines of, I'm willing to pay 20 coins for every piece of red furniture that you have. Now that you've planted the seed in their head, they'll be actively on the lookout for this mysterious red furniture. Step 5. Enter the second account. You don't want to attract or arouse suspicion, so you arrive some time later. Your second account is the account that has your disposable furniture. Again, you browse the shop, establishing a relationship with the shop owner. Then you inquire, do you buy furniture by any chance? If they don't, ask whether they want to trade. Chances are a shop owner would be somewhat interested by your proposition, and so… Step 6. Make the hard sell. Tell the owner that you're selling rare items like oh, I don't know, this red pixel furniture that you just so happen to have. By offering to sell it at a much lower price than what the fake buyer is offering, like 10 coins, you create an almost irresistible opportunity for the shop owner. And then you do the trade, and that's how you just earn 10 coins on a piece of furniture that was only worth a hundredth of that. The emergence of these more sophisticated and complex scams show an evolution of the art of scamming and an evolution of financial crime as a whole. As the players of Habo get progressively smarter and more informed about scams, scam artists find themselves having to resort to greater lengths to part you from your money. But scams aren't the only forms of financial crime on Habo Hotel. With corporations playing an increasingly larger role in Habo over the past few years, some players have spotted a new opportunity on the horizon. In November 2017, Cess, also known as May, ascended to the highest office of the Habo White House, the presidency. Her election was a landmark in the organisation's history as she became the White House's first female president. Meanwhile, Infernum, also known as Craig, was packing his bags. Having served his two-month term, he was now the outgoing president. Following the footsteps of 14 previous presidents, he now bore responsibility to pass the keys of the presidency to his successor. This democratic transition of power is the cornerstone of the Habo White House. Rarely do agencies or corporations hold elections for their highest office. And so, as the keys of power were being handed over, a fact transpired. The treasury account was empty. Most corporations had a special treasury account. Any donations or profits earned from sales would be stored in this account. 
Treasury accounts meant that multiple trusted people could do transactions on the organization's behalf, and it also made accounting a lot more easier. It has also led to the problem of $400 worth of coins being embezzled from the Treasury with no obvious culprit. An inquiry was quickly held, and soon fingers were pointed at both Cess and Infernum. The heist was done in perfect timing. The transition period between presidencies meant that both Cess and Infernum had access to the Treasury account at the same time. The inquiry went cold, and the culprit was never found. The rise in corporate crime is a more recent phenomenon. As corporations play a much more significant role in the day-to-day -day lives of players, they present greater and more audacious opportunities for any would-be criminals to exploit. As for our story, the Habo White House learnt its lesson and reformed the Treasury to prevent future presidents from embezzling funds. One of these reforms was to put the hands of the Treasury account to one single trustee, chosen from an elected board. That way, only one person could access the account. If anything went missing, it was clear who the culprit was. With these reforms in place, the White House had to start over, and through donation drives and sales, they managed to rebuild the treasury. All in all, they managed to reaccumulate $450 worth of coins and rares. And these treasury reforms ended up working. For one year, when in 2018, a trustee called Jess emptied out the entire treasury account after the White House tried to impeach her for allegedly working for the Habo Mafia. Of course, embezzlement and corruption doesn't just happen in the Habbo White House. But with so many careers, livelihoods, and money on the line, many people who I approached simply did not want to talk about this topic. A high-ranking official of one of Habbo's largest corporations eventually decided to talk to me under the strict condition of anonymity. In our interview, they made explosive allegations against their corporate founder. They claimed the founder would regularly use the treasury as their personal bank account, withdrawing thousands of coins at a time to sell in the black market to quote-unquote fuel their clubbing habit. In fact, the embezzlement of corporate funds was done so frequently, the board of directors actively fabricate numbers in their spreadsheet, and underreport the revenue earned to their founder to prevent them from literally sinking the company into debt. In another claim, one of the founder's deputies managed to achieve their high rank by regularly sending gifts to the founder. Over the course of a few years, an estimated total of $3,000 worth of gifts were given by this deputy. This deputy is the second highest ranking official of the corporation. And, in order to dominate the market further, the founder was even alleged to have tried to create a second corporation. Pouring thousands of coins worth of investment into it, their intention was to monopolise the entire agency industry by falsifying the illusion of choice. Workers of said corporation would think that they were working for a rival company, when in fact it was staffed by the same administration, just with alt accounts. If successful, the founder would operate two profitable corporations, doubling their intake. Ten people showed up to its opening ceremony, and the project was scrapped three weeks later. When I asked another high-ranking official of the same corporation to comment on these allegations, they disputed the claims. The founder does not take money from us unless necessary, said the official. They insisted that revenue earned was reinvested back into the corporation. A dig into the company's finances revealed that in 2019, the company's annual turnover was approximately 300,000 credits. That is equivalent to 20,000 US dollars if the coins were sold at black market rates. A vast majority of the corporation's revenue came from rank sales, which is where an employee would pay to get a higher rank. Other streams of revenue include selling VIP and special visitor passes, which give privileges to rich people that can afford them. Of that revenue, approximately 70% was spent on wages, totaling up to $16,800 worth of coins. The high-ranking officials that I was talking to also get a slice in the form of commission when they successfully make a sale. On average, each of these officials make 2,000 credits annually, or $160. The last 20% is the founder's profit, also known as a reinvestment fund, which totals up to 60,000 credits, or $4,800. With corporations presenting such lucrative pay for those at the top, it is no longer a mystery why so few want to blow the whistle. Angelic is no stranger to scams. Having been twice a victim, she lost all of her furniture and coins. In total, she bought over $130 worth of virtual goods legitimately on Haber Hotel. But when she tried to contact Habbo to help, Habbo simply told her that she couldn't recover her stolen items that she paid for. 
This is in line with Habbo's policy and terms of service. Habbo defines their virtual currency and goods not as property but as part of the gameplay experience, or, as Habbo puts it, you have no interest, including no property, proprietary, intellectual property, ownership or monetary interest in your virtual currency and virtual goods, which remain our content and property. This effectively means that you don't enjoy the same protections with virtual property as you do with real property, because under the Habbo Terms of Service, your coins and your furniture aren't even your property. They belong to Habbo and Habbo could theoretically do whatever it wants with it. The question of whether these Terms of Service are legally enforceable is a rather murky question and depends where you live, but internationally there is a trend where countries are beginning to recognise that virtual property deserves the same protection. In one notable case in 2003, hackers gained access to a player's account and stole $1,200 worth of virtual items. A Beijing court found Optic Ice, the developers of the game, liable for the loss suffered by the player and was forced to reimburse the lost property. In that case, the game publishers argued that virtual items are merely a pile of data and could not constitute a thing that could be stolen under Chinese law. The rejection of this interpretation led China to become one of the first countries to recognise that virtual property is entitled to the same legal protections as other forms of property. Furthermore, Arctic Ice also argued that the player agreed to the terms of service which stated that the security of a player's account is their own responsibility, and by extension, the player is responsible if their stuff gets stolen. This echoes Habo policy, which describes being a victim of a scam as user error, and Habo states that it does not allow for reimbursement for quote unquote user error. Arctic Ice argued that the company had no obligation to reimburse the lost items, but the court also rejected this argument. If other countries adopt a similar legal interpretation, Habbo's policy may not actually be legally enforceable. In a more recent case in 2012, the Dutch Supreme Court followed suit and held that virtual items can be considered goods which can be stolen. The argument that virtual goods were mere bits and bytes was rejected. Putting legality aside, however, Habbo is entirely within their power to reimburse victims of financial crime. In the terms of service, Habbo writes that they reserve the absolute right at any time in our sole discretion to manage, regulate, control, modify or eliminate virtual currency and or virtual goods. Habbo actively refuses to do this, instead choosing to blame the victim of a crime by calling it user error. When I tried to contact Tsulake, the company that owns Habo on why they operate such a policy, they did not respond to my request for comment. I'm not the first person to have highlighted the issues of Habo's opaque policies. Seven years ago in 2013, two professors wrote that the players of Habo are learning to be diligent consumers buying virtual products that will help to construct their identities and relationships, in a context where everything they produce and everything they appear to possess is in fact owned by a company that remains largely unaccountable for its business practices. The professors claim that children are the primary consumers of Habo. According to a survey done in 2004, 75% of players on Habo were between 10 to 14 years old. Unlike adult consumers, however, children tend to have less resources to defend themselves against unfair business practices. In many cases, this sense of disempowerment leads to anger and to forms of activism, wrote the professors. Some users respond to what they regard as injustice by insulting or threatening either the company or the individual moderators. Others develop plans to bankrupt Habbo Hotel by creating illegal replicas. Some Hispanic players felt so shafted by Habbo's business practices, they even formed the Habbo Revolutionary Union. Depressingly, these issues were highlighted seven years ago, and in the past seven years, nothing has changed. Angelic's tale isn't just one tragic story of someone getting their virtual goods stolen, it is a tale repeated over and over again, a tale Habbo has been accustomed to, and one where Habbo, in every case, chooses not to act. In fairness, there is a case to be made in Habbo's defence. The policy of not reimbursing victims of crime is a standard in MMOs. RuneScape, for example, does not reimburse victims of scams. In their lost items policy, RuneScape claims that their focus is on the prevention of crime, as opposed to what they call dealing with the fallout and chasing after the harm has been done. The question should therefore be whether virtual goods should be treated differently by the industry as a whole, as opposed to Habbo itself. Habbo, like RuneScape, also claims that their focus is on warning players about scams and educating players, and to their credit, there is some evidence of this. As mentioned before, Habbo has a comprehensive list of scams in their help pages. 
The issue is, you have to dig quite a bit to actually find it. There is also a pinned news article from 2018 warning people of phishing sites. Habo also hires ambassadors, specifically selected volunteers whose role is to help welcome new players into the community and help moderate public rooms. They also host events called Infobus sessions, where they raise awareness of certain issues. One of these issues was on scams and fraud. To find out whether these sessions actually worked, I decided to attend one and was immediately greeted by a queue. Each session takes around 15 to 25 minutes and the bus has limited capacity. These restrictions created a massive line, and I begrudgingly waited for my turn. After some time, the old batch exited the bus and a new batch of people were allowed in. Only then did I learn I was person 25. The maximum capacity of the bus was 24. Needless to say, I very much wasn't amused. I was finally allowed to enter the bus and Josh, my ambassador, immediately begins laying down the ground rules. Josh then proceeds to tell players not to visit random URLs given by complete strangers, a good tip. They also recommended the use of Habbo's safety lock feature, where Habbo would ask users security questions before they can fully access their account, another good tip. Josh also gives password advice such as changing your password regularly and using lots of numbers, symbols and capital letters, which is actually outdated advice. What should have been emphasised instead is the fact that you should use different passwords for different platforms in case one of your passwords get compromised in a data breach, and one way in which you can manage your passwords is with any password manager. That could have been a perfect segue. No one offered to sponsor me, so... Anyways, the session ends, and then we are thrown into the deep end to complete a quiz before we receive a special badge which we can pin on our user profile. When asked to comment, a different ambassador who wished to stay anonymous said that they and their fellow colleagues genuinely believe that their sessions are helpful in educating users. However, they also privately expressed doubts. One of these doubts revolved around giving away free badges. While free stuff works great as an incentive for people to attend these sessions, they end up mostly attracting veteran and seasoned players, the people least likely to fall for basic scams. These players end up taking up space which would otherwise be more useful to newer players. But apart from writing a few articles and asking volunteer players to run education sessions, Habbo doesn't actually seem to be doing that much. Which begs the question, why? Why doesn't Habbo do more in tackling financial crime? As Habbo hasn't replied to my inquiry, we can only speculate. One reason could be that some scams are just really sophisticated. For example, during my visit, someone hosted a fake giveaway. In this giveaway, the scammer asked people to visit this website to comment on their photo. This website is a phishing website. It's a fake website that looks just like Habbo and it is designed to steal people's personal information. Once the scammer obtains this information, they log into the victim's account, steal their items, and change their password so that they can no longer access their account. What makes the scam so effective, however, is account hopping. This is when a scammer uses one of these stolen accounts to set up shop. They advertise the fake giveaway under this stolen account. Once they've run the scam using that account for a few days, they move on to a new stolen account. This is what happened to Angelic. She found out that not only was her account hacked, but it was used to set up one of these fake giveaways. As for Victoria, the person pictured running the scam, her account was stolen too. But not only did she learn that her coins and furniture were stolen, she learned that her account was being hijacked to run the fraudulent giveaway. Players, none the wiser, began to spread the message through word of mouth that Victoria is a scammer, completely ruining her reputation in the process. When she tried to contact Habbo to recover her account, she received no response. Instead, Habbo decided to ban her hacked account permanently for scamming. The scammers were undeterred and simply moved on to a different account. But this explanation is not satisfying. Firstly, not all scams are this sophisticated. There are still many rudimentary and basic scams that are being done without any consequence for the scammer. Secondly, it would put the competence and effectiveness of moderation in question, if it exists at all. This brings us to our second possible explanation, the lack of moderation. The ambassador I spoke to gave harsh and scathing criticism against the state of moderation Habbo, decrying it next to non-existent. 
While in my previous video I claimed that there were no moderators on Habo, the ambassador informed me that they were told by staff that there were off-client moderators, mods who would review flight content from outside the game. These moderators don't actually log into the game, and therefore don't have a clear picture of what actually is happening. If they do exist, they are doing a terrible job, they remarked. But if this is true, this also brings with it a troubling thought. The last time that Habo lacked moderation, this happened. Good evening, it is every parent's terror that their internet literate child will arrive in a make-believe children's web world that is so unsafe that he or she can be propositioned for sex by a paedophile within four minutes. And finally, there is a third and much more cynical explanation on why Habo doesn't do that much. There simply is no financial incentive. In theory, a business would promote customer service because good customer service would overall lead to more customers. That's why businesses tolerate even the most obnoxious of Karens. However, Habo runs differently from other businesses. Their monetization model revolves around the sale of virtual currency, currency that would only be worth something to players that actually play the game. If you're going to buy coins from Habo, chances are you're already deep in it. Going back to the paper written by the two professors, they observed that as users spend more time on Habo, they create what is known as social capital, which basically means friendships act as their own currency. When someone stops playing Habo, either by quitting or by being banned, they lose this social capital, in other words, their friendships. As Habo prohibits, or tries to prohibit, people from sharing links to external communication websites like Discord, they effectively monopolise the social capital generated by their players. Or to put it in another way, the only way to meet your friends is through Habo. What this means is that the cards are effectively stacked in Habo's favour. You can quit if you want, but if you quit, all your possessions are gone, all your creative labour is gone, and all of your social capitals, your friends, are also gone. As one player remarked, Believe me, I know what it's like to get f***ed up by these mods. You spend money, and they don't even think for a second about your friends, money spent, etc. When there is such a large disparity of power between a company and its customers, a company no longer needs to entertain the idea of customer satisfaction. You're going to play Habo anyways, and Habo knows you're going to spend more money, so why bother? If you're not convinced by this explanation, or believe it is unduly cynical, just note that when something directly threatens Habo's financial interests, the lack of moderation becomes a non-issue. In 2017, two hackers made use of an exploit to generate millions of coins into their accounts. Soon, they went on a full-on shopping spree, buying tons of rare items. Their shopping spree generated a surge in demand, and soon the rares market entered into a frenzy. People bought thrones of 500 coins and resold them at 700. In one instance, two players even bought rare items with their real-life money and sold them to the hackers at marked-up prices. The hackers didn't mind, after all, they could just generate more coins. Habo caught on, and the admins quickly suspended all trade and market activity on the platform. The hackers were banned along with millions of coins, totalling up to hundreds of thousands of US dollars. If Habo really wants to intervene, it most certainly has the capacity to do so. With Habo currently riding the nostalgia wave after people have nothing more to do due to the current situation, hiding behind excuses of lack of funding for moderation is no longer acceptable, although it never was to begin with when you're making a game targeted at teenagers and children. When Habo fails to act or appropriately respond, it is a deliberate choice made by its top management. Just to clarify, I don't blame the staff members working at Habo. Over the course of this year, I've seen staff take a more proactive and visible approach, especially in regards to community engagement. But what they can do, and what they can spend time on, is ultimately decided upon by Habo itself, and it's Habo's failings to allocate adequate resources into tackling financial crime that have led Habo to become complicit in it. Now, your first question might be, Trolligarch, have you been scammed before? And my response is, no I actually haven't. Not that people haven't tried to scam me before, I've seen it all, but the fact I haven't fallen victim to one is probably due to vigilance and awareness. Now the keen eyed of you would have noticed that I've dedicated an entire part of this video to a personal note, and so in response to your second question, yes, yes I have. 
I have pulled off some falling furniture and fake buyer scams in the past, but that didn't satisfy me. 15 year old me wanted to do something more adventurous, so I began brainstorming for ideas. Although, if you thought this was going to be some amateurish affair, you are sorely mistaken. After doing a painstaking amount of planning, I eventually came up with a master plan, the Arrow Giveaway. If you watched my previous video on capitalism on Habo, you would know that I spent an entire section dedicated to dodgy giveaways. The reason why I know so much about them is because I ran one myself. And this is how it worked. Firstly, a user would queue up. Once it's their go, they will pull this switch. This switch can do one of two things. The first thing it can do is move the arrow to the right. And the second thing it can do is teleport you to the exit, which means you have lost the game. There is a 50-50 chance of either event happening. If you're wondering why I couldn't just rig the odds, I deliberately placed the wires, the mechanism to run this game, in plain sight. It was right there, and those who could understand why it could see it. If the user is lucky enough, they will reach a point where the arrow is pointing to a prize. If this happens, the user is offered two choices, risk or keep. If they say keep, they get the prize indicated on the arrow. If they say risk, they pull the switch again, with a 50% chance to win a greater prize and a 50% chance of losing everything. Now that I have a game made, next I needed to figure out a monetization model. The predominant way of monetizing games like these is with FastPass. This is when a user pays the owner a membership fee, something like 20 coins to get instant or near instant access to the game. There can be other benefits, such as a chance to win a greater prize not available to the peasants. I didn't go for this route. While it was certainly legal, albeit ethically dubious, it most certainly wasn't a sustainable route. When someone purchases FastPass, they only do it once. You can charge someone as high of a price as you want, 20 coins, 50 coins, 100 coins, but the goal of a FastPass purchaser is to get their money back and profit. If you give them unlimited and unfettered access to your game, they will eventually make their money back and you will begin operating at a loss. FastPass operators deal with this with a variety of solutions. One way to deal with this issue is to simply host less. If you host the game less, your FastPass customers simply have less time to win prizes, which reduces their chance of making their money back. But if you host less, you sell less FastPass. It's just that simple. The second solution is to pack up your bags and leave. Once you sell enough fast passes, you stop hosting, close down the giveaway and open it under a new name where people have to buy a new fast pass. The issue with this, however, is that this will inevitably trash your reputation. You could try and avoid this problem by moving everything to a new account and hosting your new giveaway with that account, but this is way too much work for my liking. And the third solution is to make fast passes time limited. You put an expiration date when you remove someone's fast pass. This seems like the most sustainable option, but it still falls into the pit trap where people are unlikely to pay for fast pass a second time. If your fast pass purchases are unable to recoup their losses for the first time, they're not going to renew their membership. Then one day I visited someone else's giveaway and saw a novel innovation. Rather than charge for FastPass, they had two queues. One was the peasant queue, and the other was the donator's queue. How it worked was people who wanted to donate lined up in the donator's queue. When they reach the front of the donator's queue, they pay a coin or an item to the host. The host will then give them access to the game. The peasant and donator queues are run concurrently, but as more people are lined up in the peasant queue, the donator's queue is inevitably quicker. To sweeten the deal, however, donors got a chance to win higher prizes. This was a much better monetization model. Every time someone wanted to use the donator's queue, they had to donate something. This meant that the scheme was sustainable, it was effectively a pay-as-you-go model. It was also much more open to others. FastPass schemes tend to target Habbo's middle class, players who are desperate to earn any coins they can, but are also in a position to splash 50 coins for a FastPass in the first place. With this system, even a person with one coin could join the donator's queue. And also, being rather bold, it allowed me to claim that I was not running a FastPass system. So I just nixed the idea. For further profit, I planned to sell host licenses. For the price of 20 coins, you could host my game in my absence. Any payments you received, you could profit from. This also was a further positive for my scheme, because it helped promote my brand name. When I opened my Arrow giveaway, I did not expect it to become an instant hit. 
It was so successful that in the span of two months, I was able to afford an entire renovation of my room. It cost 200 coins and was entirely unnecessary, but it was so successful that I decided to do it, just because I can. And if you're about to comment that 200 coins is nothing, wealth is relative. But why was it so successful? I don't actually know, but I speculate that it's because it's almost like legalised gambling. With Fastpass giveaways, the goal of the Fastpass purchaser is to make their money back and earn a profit. With my giveaway, you're paying for a premium go at a game that is pure random chance. Many of my frequent donors actually pointed out that they get the same buzz from my giveaway as they would get from casinos and grabbers. The difference is, the latter is banned. I ensured I covered my tracks. I was pretty explicit in telling people that my random chance game was not gambling, because unlike gambling where you must pay for a go, you could just line up in the peasant queue for a free go and win free prizes. And I ended up being right, because Waltz Matilda, an admin of Habo, once visited my room and had a go at my game. They complimented me and my staff for running the giveaway and then just left us alone. So you might be wondering, I ran an ethically dubious borderline casino giveaway, but that's not illegal. So where's the criminal aspect of it? And the answer is, well, it was rigged. I told you earlier that I placed the wide in plain sight and so it was not possible for it to be rigged, but I still managed to find a way to do it anyways. To explain specifically how I did it, I'm going to need to give you some background. Wired is the redstone of Habo. What it allows people to do is to make functions. Each wired function requires an input and an output. You can tell which is which because inputs are brown boxes and outputs are silver boxes. To make a function, you stack the two boxes together. For example, this input box checks to see whether you have double clicked an item, like a switch. This output box, meanwhile, allows you to change the state of an item. If a door is locked, it will open, and vice versa. By stacking these two boxes together, we have created a wide function that allows us to control this door using this switch. There is also a third type of wired, conditions. If you add a condition box to your stack, your wired will only perform a function if that condition is met. For example, this condition box checks an item state. I can set it up so that you can only open a door with this switch if this light is turned on. If the light is turned off, the switch does nothing. Now let's analyse the piece of wide I showed you earlier. This input box takes an input from this switch. This box is called random effect. When it is placed in a wide stack, it makes it so that only one randomly chosen effect is triggered at a time. Finally, there are my two effect boxes. One is a teleport effect that will teleport you to the exit, which means you lose. The other is a move effect, which moves the arrow towards the right. As we have the random effect box, instead of having both effects happen simultaneously, only one will be randomly selected. This setup on its own is not rigged. You genuinely have a 50-50 chance on whether you move the arrow or teleport to the exit. There is one important rule in wide, however, and that is each stack of wide is its own function. But the stack does not have to be continuous. You can have an input and an output box separated by air and the function still works. So, if we look up, you will notice an additional piece of wide I didn't talk about. That box is a condition box. It will only allow this function to activate if this light is on. I also have a second wired function. In this function, the input is the same switch. The output box is teleporting to the exit, and the function only operates when the light is off. With this setup, I can make it so that if the light is on, the game works as normal, but if the light is off, you are 100% guaranteed to teleport to the exit. I can flick the light to set the game so that it is either in normal mode or rigged mode. Now, if you noticed something, you will realise that when the game is in a normal, unrigged state, the wide boxes activate and play a small animation. When the game is in a rigged state, those wide boxes are not activated and so they don't play this animation. So to create the illusion that the wide boxes are activated, I simply created another wide function. The input is the switch and the output is this, which allows me to change the state of an item. I showed you previously that it can open doors, but it can also turn on lights, do this, and most importantly, trigger the animation effect. Only the owner and those with rights given by the owner can look inside of these wired boxes, so the only way that people could verify something is legit is if it looks legit. 
I deliberately placed my wide set up, or some of it, in the public view to give the perception that I was fully transparent. I went through all of that trouble just to make my game look authentic, more real than the other games that were actually legit, as placing wide in public view is not standard practice. People could see the wire churning away every time a user clicked the switch. No one would have suspected that there was a piece of wide up in the sky, but just in case, I put a present up there to obscure the view. Now, I didn't have to do this. I could have made my giveaway completely legit. The way I set up the game meant the odds were in my favour to begin with. Statistically, over time, this was a profitable business venture, but this still didn't give me enough control of the game. I wanted to be able to control specifically what prizes I was going to be giving out. Even if you made a jackpot harder to obtain, there will still always be a chance that someone actually wins it, and that means you'll always have to be prepared to pay for a jackpot, and I wasn't willing to do that. I decided to tell my story because I wanted to show that the ultra-consumerist environment, where your social standing is defined by the coins in your wallet, the furniture and rares in your possession, and your membership of a premium club, creates an extraordinary and insatiable demand for coins. And, teenagers being the perfect demographic to psychologically manipulate, they are the ones that are willing to do extraordinary things to get virtual currency. I personally ran my criminal enterprise with no nefarious intent to make real life money. I just wanted furniture so I could furnish my rooms and make cool things, something that Habo has decided to lock behind a paywall because it's their monetization model. But the environment that Habo crafted led 15 year old me to become obsessed with these virtual coins and I ended up concocting a ridiculously over the top conspiracy to obtain it. I spent way too long planning meticulously every detail from monetization to how I was going to rig it without getting caught to how I would present myself as the real deal. What I did was not some large scale hacking operation or setting up a phishing site, but at the end of the day what I did was still wrong even if it was comparatively minor, and it's something I genuinely regret doing, and something I've never done since. Every MMO with an economy will have financial crime. This is a simple truth. What Habo has shown is that players will find new and innovative ways of defrauding others, no matter how the game progresses. However, the current industry of MMOs do not respect the rights of virtual property that people possess, despite the fact that they are materially worth something. Maybe this is for the better. After all, if every MMO had to legally reimburse victims of financial crime, they would be inundated with a flood of requests, including by those willing to exploit that very system. But maybe there should be a re-evaluation. Players spend real life money on obtaining these virtual currencies and goods, and these items end up having lots of sentimental value attached to them. If we believe that virtual items should be afforded the same rights and protections as ordinary property, we should expect to reform the law, as opposed to waiting for the entrenched industry to regulate itself. As for Habo more specifically, more needs to be urgently done. If Habo insists that prevention is better than cure, it needs to make sure that its preventative measures are actually working. Hiring a bunch of volunteers to run occasional bus sessions is not enough. Pending a news article warning about phishing scams is also not enough, because at the end of the day, if people can still flagrantly host fake giveaways advertising dangerous external links, people are going to fall for it. There needs to be in-game moderation shutting down these blatant scams, and there needs to be a more concerted effort into rooting out these scammers. Having a visible and vigorous approach to tackling financial crime will go some way to deterring future attempts by enterprising players. As for my own story, I still have regrets. Some of the coins and furniture that I have in my possession were illicitly gained, certainly not all of them though, but I decided that the only way to repent for my sins was to give it all away. I will admit it was extremely difficult to do. I was attached to my coins and my furniture which I've earned over the past few years. My wide collection and my prized furniture of the Queen has sentimental value to me. But I decided to do it anyways, and there was no turning back. It was certainly gratifying, however, to make someone's day. Anyways, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a nice day.